Riverbed Technology was founded in 2002, and its original focus was on WAN optimization to improve network performance, which, with the current AI wave, continues to be really important. The company went public in 2006 and grew very rapidly, and then in December 2014, Riverbed announced it would be taken private. Now it's owned by Vector Management. In the summer of 2023, Riverbed brought in a new CEO, Dave Donatelli, an individual with a proven track record of driving product and operational excellence, joining me today to give the updates on Riverbed, its recent progress, and some new survey data is the CEO of Riverbed, David Donatelli. Welcome to our studio here in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be with you. So you guys just released a survey, some findings from a global AI study. Uh, we're showing the cover of that here. It's 1,200 IT decision makers focused on the state of AI adoption. We're going to re review some of those findings, but tell us, why did you conduct the survey? What were some of the key takeaways from your perspective? Sure. Well, we like to do a survey every year to kind of tune into what's happening in the marketplace. Um, last year, our survey, as an example, highlighted the fact that people wanted to move to fewer IT tools that covered more of their environment. People are looking to simplify their environment. Um, so we built a lot of products based on that. This year, as you know, AI discussions have been all the rage. So we thought it was important to check in globally to see where people really were with AI. And as you know, we're, we're deep into the hype cycle, not so deep into the actual implementation and, and use case cycle of AI at this point in time. Well, I like the end, 1200 global survey, so you can really dig into the data. We have some other data points from the survey related to adoption and some of the things that are holding adoption back. Here we're showing a, <laughs> is a reality gap. It's very unlikely that 82% of the firms are ahead of their competitors. So there may be some blind spots there for, for some of the respondents. And we've talked extensively in the cube about the data challenges. You got to get your data act together before you can do good AI. And of course, most firms, 72%, according to the Riverbed survey, say it's hard to scale. So from your perspective, what are some of the obstacles and gaps that customers are facing? Yeah, you know, it's, it's one of these interesting things because if you take it up a level and you look at the CEOs, 94% of CEOs want to implement this. Why? It, to me, it harkens back to they don't want to get caught in the dot-com trap again. You know, it says, you know, when the dot-com era happened more than 20 years ago now, but you and I happened to be working back then, you saw some companies get caught, go out of business. You saw other companies flourish like never before. They pivoted. Think companies like Walmart. You know, Walmart's bigger and better than ever right. as a retailer and, and new companies emerge. CEOs have seen this. What they're saying is, hey, I'm not going to be that company. I, I want to make sure our, our organization is one that it advances really well. Well, that's all wonderful to say, but if we go to the chart where you talk about what are the challenges, most people, only 37% say they're really ready for it. Um, only 40%, four out of 10 are confident in their data. And then as you also saw the whole, whole issue around overconfidence where 82% of people are saying, hey, I'm better than everybody else. Hey. Only <laughs> mathematically that doesn't quite work out. Um, and, and I think it really comes down to data and practicality it is really one of the big concerns already. We've known for years that getting data right is key to having good machine learning, good AI. And it's a problem that companies of all sizes and organizations of all sizes struggle with. If you're a smaller organization, it's very challenging to do both from a budget and technology perspective. If you're a larger organization, it really gets down to, um, not the technology side, cause they're pretty good at that, but really internal. You know, are there limitations if you're a multi-national um, kind of company where you can share data to use for AI? There's definitely political problems as well within organizations. Hey, I, I run this region. I'm not going to give my data to that region. I've seen that uh, as being a big inhibitor. So put all that together. It's more complex than people like to talk about on TV. And it takes a while for people to really get to practical solutions at work. And I think that's what we're going to settle in on, practical solutions at work. You know, what's interesting about what you're saying is, we all talk in the industry, you hear it all the time, we've never seen the pace of technology as fast as it is today. Maybe that's true, but for sure the adoption is not faster than it's ever been. I mean, if you look at historically, it's like every 10 years, some new wave comes in. Sure. And it takes a long time for the reasons that you mentioned. The technology is one thing. It's, you know, it's, I know it's bromide, but it's people in process and it just takes a long time. So, so how long do you think it will take to overcome some of these gaps? Well, 86% of the people said that it, within three years, they think they're ready. And I, I think that's a reasonable, I think that's a reasonable number in the sense that, look, as you know, there's massive investment going in across from the producers of the technology. 
you have 94% of the people who want to consume it, i.e. the CEOs who are going to ask all their people when they budget, what's your AI budget and what are you doing for me? And I think within three years, you, you'll start to see real progress, but it's not three months. You know, it's, it's over time. Now, on our products, I can tell you where we focus just on specific areas, not what I call, you know, enterprise-wide AI, but AI to solve practical problems. We already see customers doing that today. Yeah, you know, for instance, I was talking to a regional bank the other day. In, in our case, they're solving over 13,000 incidents that they used to have to use with humans now through full automation. So again, that's a more practical solution within a, a reasonable scope and scale that you can do, but also offers real benefits to the end user. What, what's interesting is our survey data with our survey partner suggests that there's a real solid mix, like 50-50 between those that want to do AI on their own and those with embedded AI. You're talking about embedded AI. And I've always said, you're most likely going to buy AI that's embedded, whether it's in applications or other products then going off and building your own. But surprisingly today anyway, I think a lot of people want to you know, do experiments and that maybe is holding things back. So there's a lot of hype around AI as we know, but as your survey shows here, the C-suite is firmly behind AI initiatives. You know, Even if they're not completely opening their checkbooks, our, our survey data also shows that about 45% of the customers are stealing from other budgets to fund AI. But there's broad consensus that AI is going to be the biggest tech wave we've ever seen. Uh, if the entire industry is wrong on this front, we're all in trouble. Uh, it's going to be a very large proportion of your survey base here it says they're accelerating AI. So how do how do we move, Dave, beyond the hype into you know real practical? Yeah, I I, I think we're again still at the beginning stage that you mentioned. Right, half the people want to build their own. May I remind you of Hadoop clusters? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wanted to build their own of those as well, and and you don't see a lot of people bragging about the results they got out of that over time. So I think, you know, if you look at it, the expertise resides in the providers. They have the engineers, they have the years of experience, and they have the data. And you need all three of those to really make things work. So while I think it's always tempting for people to want to self-build, uh, particularly big, sophisticated organizations, not saying they can't do that, but in, for most of the people out there listening to this, whether you're in a government organization or whether you're in a business, you're probably going to buy from somebody else. And, and the people you're going to buy from are the you know traditional providers in the technology industry, whether they're mainstream folks have been around a while or whether it's a startup that's delivered. And why is that? Because focus, expertise, and understanding of specific areas. Second thing I'd say is, is again, I don't think the Uber you know enterprise-wide solution is really practical at this point in time. We've got to work our way there. What people really want are, are built-in AI-type solutions, helping them solve problems that they already have today. Well, you know, too, when you look at, um, to your point, when you look at what people are actually doing with AI today, it's very chat GPT like they're summarizing text. They're maybe, you know, creating images. Uh, there's, there's certainly some code generation and that's great. Uh, but to your point, people want to just, they want just th want this stuff to work. They want it to drive more productivity. And so I think you're right. It's probably going to take a few years, especially when you look at everybody's talking about, you know, agents um, um, or co-pilots, right? Sim, but they're really single agents. You know, we're imagining a world where you've now got multiple swarms of, of these working together. As you well know, you got all this data and IP locked up inside of applications. There's metadata, there's business logic, et cetera. And in getting to that is going to you know, take some time. Once you can get to that, now you can, I mean, the user interface is going to change. It's going to be speaking to it. So so those are some of the adoption challenges. Was there anything in the survey, anything else that you were surprised at that stood out that sort of was were shockers to you? Um, I don't think, I mean, personally, I don't think it was shocking, but I think it was a good dose of reality for everybody to understand, right? As you saw, I think the most shocking thing was the overconfidence. Oh yeah, we've got this, yeah. you know, down. And the reality piece of, well, maybe in three years we have this down. And so I think it's always important to, to really be frank about where do we really stand in the market? It's a great technology. It's going to make a big difference, but we're moving into it. It's, you know, in, in a typical evolution cycle versus just a revolutionary cycle. Let's talk a little bit about Riverbed and some of your unique IP and what you're doing in this space. Walk us through the value components of your business and that, that, that differentiated strategy that you have. How would you describe your approach? We're showing here, you know, your unified agent, your Riverbed IQ, of which is your intelligence. You've got all this great dashboarding. Help, help us understand why Riverbed, what's unique, and how it differentiates from the competition. Yeah, in its simplest form, what we do is, is we help prevent, identify, and resolve 
problems that people have in their IT space. And whether that's at, at an endpoint, whether that's in their network, whether that's a problem with their application. As you're aware, you know, IT environments get more complex every day, uh, whether you're talking about what people run in-house, how they interact with the cloud, people working from home. And because of all those factors, it gets harder to determine when something breaks, what is it, where is it, how do I fix it as soon as possible? And then ideally, how do I prevent it from breaking at all? That's in essence the problem we solve. And we help people uh, by really ending what I call blind spots in their environment. Meaning that as the environment continues to expand, um, you know, people have a need to understand more about what's happening in that expanded environment. Let me give an example, mobile devices. It, with mobile devices today, you know, people tell you industry analysts to say companies are deploying 150 million of these a year. And you see them everywhere. You go on an airplane today, how are they checking you in? Oh, hi, Dave, it's great to see you again. I see that you're a premier flyer with us. Mm. That's a mobile device, mission critical to them now. If you look at your power company, when they come out to work in your environment or work on recovering from one of these storms we're having, mobile device. So it's the front door of the enterprise mission critical. But up until now, no one had a way of seeing that. That's what I mean by a blind spot. So if something is going wrong, people need to understand what is going wrong, how do I fix it as soon as possible to get my people, make them productive. That's in essence what we do. And we do that again at all different levels of the enterprise. AI is important to what we do because it enables people to take the human element out of it. Because simply put, people are getting inundated with alerts, inundated with problems. And it's too much for someone just to swivel around and look at screens to do. You need automation to help do that. And you need data to do that. So one of the important things we've done, and it's a product we actually don't sell, but it's fundamental to all our products, is we built a, a data store that scales. So for years, you mentioned the company's been in business more than 20 years. We have collected data, data around how your network is working, data how your applications are working, as I just talked about, data about how your mobility works. The key with all that data is it's real. It's not synthetic data. So we take only real data. We have a data store that scales and enables us to aggregate all that data together and then find what I call the proverbial needle in the haystack. What has gone wrong? Is it my network? Is it my app? Is it someone working from home? And give you the ability through automation and AI to understand what that is and through what we call remediations, if you so desire, automatically fix it for you. So the account I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the AI, um, the AI survey, 13,000 events for them, which is a mid-sized business, in 90 days that were fixed through automation, no human intervention. So that's in essence what we do, is that we collect data that we can then use to analyze and automate, again, the detection or prevention or fix of problems, and then we report it out. Typically, we report out our results. Most of our customers run ServiceNow. We automatically report ServiceNow and tell them exactly what we did and how we did. So this ties back to you can't have good AI without data, which again, sounds like a tagline and a talking point, but it's true. It's true. Uh, and, 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 and it's important for people to understand, you're not Snowflake. You have a purpose-built data store specifically for you know the markets that you're in, correct? And you're helping people with their data problem through your observability chops, you know, not through you know you're not trying to be the next great data platform. Rather, you're solving problems with 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 your unique IP, and and so how's that resonating with with customers? Do they do they get it, or when they hear, "Oh, data, you need good data," for the, are they thinking analytics? Are they thinking their data pipeline? Are they thinking all these data engineers? Do well, they understand it? Well, I think from a customer point of view, what we like to say is, "Look, we're safe, secure, and accurate." And, they, and then you talk about, you know, this gets back to our survey, right? What are some of the inhibitors mm -hmm. that that people have around AI? Um, they worry about safety in the sense of, if you look at large language models, people don't want to interact their proprietary data with outside data, and then in essence, make their data public. Very, very, you know, concerning for them. Security, the same thing. Our, our system is a closed loop system. It's only available, you know, it's only the customer's data working with, within their four walls. So extremely secure. They don't have to worry about that. Accuracy comes from only using real data. You know, we've, we've all seen, you know, the, the various hallucinations you can get when you start to use synthetic data around AI and some of the crazy answers you get. By only using real data, you get more accurate data. And to me, that's very key to adoption because, again, when you start to work with these big companies, they have really, for very smart reasons, limited what kind of outside models you can use, right, because of all the security concerns around that. And once you start to do that, back to our time about implementation, then implementation times start to get a lot longer because you got to go through all kinds of different security hurdles before you can actually get benefit. 
by making kind of a closed loop system that the customer controls what the data inputs are, makes it much easier for them to adopt. And so we think that's really a key for people. And then I think the other key to people is showing them real results is they want practical things that actually help their business to provide an ROI that's measurable versus um, more kind of far out things that sound really neat, but they're not really sure what the value they're getting. We were a tick of the box that allows you to tell the C-suite, oh yeah, we did yeah, we had our strategy. When you took over uh, as the CEO of Riverbed, as you recall, you came into our office in Palo Alto and you talked about what you were going to do. Now, of course, we we know you all the way back to, to EMC when the world was very product centric. And you told us at the time, and in fact, you talked to John last time on theCUBE about your platform focus and the importance and relationship to just the ent entire customer experience and the digital experience. So explain that that platform mindset and you know how's it going with, re with respect to customer adoption? How's it resonating? Yeah, so when we met with John, we had just announced everything. And so the great news, everything's GA. You can run it all today. And it was really in response to the survey, we talked about the last year survey where people wanted fewer tools to solve a larger part of their problem. Um, our platform combines, as I mentioned, what used to be point products. So, you know, the state of the art was to have a point product that looked at your endpoints, your PCs, your laptops, your phones, a point product that looked at your network, a point product that looked at your applications. I talked to a customer, they had 56 different tools trying to figure out what the heck was going on. So the platform itself we made takes advantage of the fact that we've been at this for over 20 years. We know a lot about network acceleration. We know a lot about network performance. We know a ton about applications and endpoints. By combining those all together with common interfaces, common, common um, abilities to manage, like the unified agent, makes their life a lot simpler. And so we've seen that resonate very well. The unified agent itself um, has really taken off very quickly. So the whole idea, as you know, customers hate agents. They don't want to have lots of agents. By having a unified agent with what we call modules that plug into it, you can get one agent. So you, when you go to the agent police, you only have one agent, but the different modules give you different technology. So we talked about in June an announcement of something called NPM Plus, Network Performance Monitoring Plus. In this world where you get zero trust networks, uh, we have people working from home, we have people accessing the cloud, traditional network monitoring no longer works. You just can't see things like you used to. NPM Plus takes that network monitoring, puts it on an endpoint, and by doing so, you now get visibility again. Where we talked about visibility is important, data is important. Right. So we've seen pretty widespread adoption of that. People are very excited about that because it's it allows them to do zero trust architectures while still having the, the observability they need in order to run those effectively in production. In, in addition to that, we're announcing our next module for the common agent. This is work we did in joint uh, engineering work with Intel. So it's a joint product we bought out and it has to do with Thunderbolt as well as with um, Wi-Fi around Intel and in, in user devices. So by sharing their technology, they, they gave us in essence with their drivers, the ability to understand what was happening Let's say you're sitting here working from home, something's gone wrong, you, you know, you want to understand what's happening. By installing that module, you get a deeper understanding of your Intel environment and we can help solve that problem faster. So, so this is extending observability beyond the PC to whatever Thunderbolt connected devices, Wi-Fi. Co correct. So, so again, it, it back to, you know, if you think about us simply, the collect, the analyze, automate, report. Blind spots are all about collection. How do I get the most understanding of what's happening in your environment so I can solve problems? We have a new one coming out as well around unified communications. So the whole idea is in real time, and we get the scenario all the time, is the board of directors, it's invariably with the board of directors. Board of directors are having some kind of meeting, let's say over teams, something goes horribly wrong <laughs> because it always does. And you know your CIO is just getting pummeled with what's happening. By having a module that goes into this unified agent, and again, these are all, you can mix and match whatever ones you want, that just deals with real time. You can understand what's happening in real time and, and therefore correct problems as they occur. So the whole idea, again, is make it easier for people to manage these very complex environments. And you know, finally, it's worth saying we do this in an open way. So our data store can collect data that's our own. As I mentioned, that's how it's built. But in addition to that, we have all kinds of integration with third-party product popular software that customers would run. It's the customer's choice, do they want to integrate that or not? Again, back to the security and safety concerns. As long as they want to put it in, we allow. You can put anything in, you can put it, you know, ingress, regress, whatever. 
And the more data we get, the more accurate solutions we, we provide. And so we think that's very important. So the Intel module, that capability fits into your unified agent. Correct. Okay. Right. So as you're... And the unified cu communications thing I talked about will be a module again into the unified agent. And so you'll see a whole series of these over time continue to come out where you'll have a whole host of selection of different things you can do with the unified agent, depending again on what your particular needs are, what your big interests are in your environment. And that's platform. You've got basically a single, I'm assuming relatively lightweight agent. Correct. And then you snap these modules in. That allows you to scale. Maybe, you know, over time you do some tuck-ins and M&A if, if it's the right architecture. And you guys do that engineering. Is that right? Correct. With, with Intel and you make sure that everything's cool and secure and governed and... Yep. And we're, and we're on that particular agent, we're going to market jointly with Intel as well. Now, you talked before about the importance of, of data um, in terms of accelerating AI. Um, what about the network, right? The network is... You know, has it, as you well know, spinning disk used to be the big bottleneck. Yeah. Right? It seems like the network is now a really a choke point here. Yeah. What I, I mean, my joke, I like to say internally, what is old is now new again. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is for the last 20 years, there's been this battle of what's faster, right? Is, 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 is there more data than the network can handle? Or, you know, people always argue the network's bigger than the amount of data going through. With AI, we've now come back again where people have a need, as you as you well know, to move tons of data at very high speed from different locations than before. So, you know, we're seeing um, the best results we've seen in our acceleration business in years. And this is an area where we have a tremendous amount of I IP. We've been at it. You know, we've been the leader in there forever. Technically, you know, if you look at all the various analysts out there, they didn't say that. Um, and people want it um, right now because of AI. And so we're really happy to do that. We've tied it into our platform as well. So it's a holistic solution where not only can we determine if you have a network issue, we can help you speed it up. And that's what our acceleration business does. When we look at our surveys, and it was, that's why I love looking at big surveys, um, yeah. things that pop up as important in 2024, security, AI, and then data, you know, getting your data house in order because it's feeding the AI. The AI. Um, and security and governance is always number one. Looking ahead to next year, what do you think and what are you hearing from customers as to what their priorities are going to be? And then what, what does that mean for the future of Riverbit? Yeah. Well, I think uh, a, big, a big thing around all customers right now is anything they're deploying has to have a really good ROI. So, uh, you know, you and I were discussing a little bit earlier off camera that, you know, spending is, is not crazy right now. It's, it's you know, people are, are managing their dollars very closely. So whatever you're doing from an IT perspective, you got to be able to show, hey, if you put this in, the, comp the, the organization is going to get a good return on it very quickly. So I think that's very important as we look into 2025. Um, we're very happy. We have great ROI tools. We'll show people immediately how much money they save by deploying our solutions. Uh, you'll continue to see the, the AI rollout. As we mentioned, you know, only 37% only of the people said they've tried Gen AI. So... Uh, um, you know, it's going to take a while and continue to roll out. In our case around AI, as I mentioned, our, our solutions that I've talked about so far are all, are all shipping today. Um, we are adding generative AI early next year as well. So you'll be able to get on your phone a thing that says, you know, something has gone wrong. You know, based on everything we see, it's your network and it's your network in Houston. And this is what you should go do with that. So we're very excited about where that's taking us. Uh, earlier, early in this quarter, you'll see predictive AI. So if you're, if you're worried about, let's say you've opened a new branch or, you know, as we said, the board is meeting somewhere and you, you want to make sure that you get alerted when, when some kind of threshold is going to happen, uh, that's all coming as well. So what I see next year is products are going to get more and more intelligent. And the more intelligent they are, they enable people to keep up with this avalanche of data they're dealing with in today's world. So kind of personal question, how the, I'm interested in how you're liking the CEO gig. You've worked for some ec epic CEOs, Dick Egan. You know, founder-led, um, Mark Hurd, uh, uh, obviously Larry Ellison, another founder-led, again, icons in the industry. How, how's it going? What have you learned from those guys? Um, any Anything you do over? What's what's it like? I would never do anything over. Um, I am so grateful for, for what I've been able to do in, in my career. You know, I've worked for seven CEOs directly. I've learned something from all of them. Um, you know, whether it was Mike Rutgers or Dick Egan or Larry Ellison or Mark Hurd, I mean, 
just so much from all these people. And I've been able to kind of, you know, everybody's different. I've been able to take kind of everything I learned from them and then kind of do it myself in my own way that works for me. Having a blast doing it. Um, what's so fun about technology, as you know, it's always changing. And I, it's so exciting to bring customers. What, I, what I've always loved is drawing something on a whiteboard, actually building it, you know, designing it, and then bringing it to the largest organizations on earth and, and having that make a difference for them, making their jobs easier, their organizations more competitive, whatever it happens to be. That's the whole fun that I, I enjoy every day. What, what I'm excited about Riverbed is when I got there, I knew the products were really good. They, they, again, it's a long track record in the industry. Riverbed products are run by virtually every large organization on earth, if, if you think about it. Uh, over time, they've run them. And, you know, we've accelerated R&D around this hot new space, which is simplify my life, use AI to automate, you know, what has been a very difficult challenge for people to have. And so I enjoy it every day. It's great. Would you describe yourself as sort of a, I mean, you've always had a product role, but then you sort of evolved into very much operational roles, which you always had, but had, you know, greater scope of responsibility. Some CEOs are very product and engineering focused. Some are more sales focused. Some are more balanced. How would you describe your primary sort of objectives and focus and comfort level? Yeah, I think what makes me different is, and, and I owe this to all these people I work for, is I've worked on every aspect of a technology company, right? So I, I was hired as a sales rep out of college and then went into software engineering, which is not a typical path. You know, hardware engineering, manufacturing, supply chain, customer service, corporate market, corporate marketing, product management. I mean, you name it. I've had professional services, <laughs> go right down the list. I've had to run all this from the ground up. And so I think it gives me a really good understanding of how all the pieces fit together and a really good empathy for how difficult each job is. I think it's easy if you don't do the other person's job to say, well, their job's easy, my job's difficult. When you've done all of them, you're kind of like, you know, I understand what their challenges are and I understand what your challenges are. Let's kind of figure out how to make this work. And, and again, my luck in doing that was I had mentors and bosses who gave me these opportunities to run in all these different places, these individual you know, roles before I took on large roles. So um, I'm equally comfortable doing a sales review in the morning and a deep engineering dive in the afternoon. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy about that. Interesting you say that because you and I have talked about this before. Um, a, a company will see what another company is doing and say, oh, we can do that. Or we can buy a company and do that. That's easy. And then they get into it and it's realize. really hard. And it's, and it's interesting and it's relevant because what Riverbed is doing is really focused and, and not trivial. So- well, congratulations on uh, on your new role. I know it's not so new anymore, and it seems like you guys are making great progress and, and appreciate your support and coming into our studio. Thanks, Dave. Always great to be with you. Yeah, good deal. Okay, and we went pretty deep today, covered the survey data, took a run through Riverbed's portfolio and, and how the company is, is transforming, building on its existing WAN acceleration business and leveraging the unique data it has to provide vis better visibility application acceleration, and other value markers, which are increasingly important as the AI wave takes hold. Thanks for watching this CUBE conversation. This is Dave Vellante for Dave Donatelli, and we'll see you next time.